Good morning, everyone. This morning we're going to talk a little bit about uh, site integration. This is the beginning of our CAD Manager series. Uh, my name is Jimmy Pro. I work here in the Engineering CAD Systems Office and uh, do a lot of the workspace configuration. So I uh, thought it would be a good idea to go through and explain this and, and the best ways to I guess customize the FDOT workspace for your environment. So this morning what we're going to talk about is uh, learn how the environment variables in the registry are set during the installation. Uh, you'll learn how to or I guess how the uh, FDOT configuration files work together to define the workspace so you can uh, understand how to customize those and uh, know where to define the, your site specific variables so you can load and customize your own information along with the uh, FDOT workspace and then hopefully what, towards the end uh, we'll get into a couple of uh, FDOT applications that run and, and look at how to customize those as well Okay, and as we go along, be sure to type in your questions. Uh, we'll uh, give us a good, uh, thorough question, and we'll be able to re respond to those uh, via the the questions and answers box there. And that'll also give us a, a good uh, FAQ list to provide with the uh, video and the PowerPoint when it gets posted. So to begin with, we'll talk about the, the installation and the types of installation. Um, basically, you can install the FDOT software in a couple of different uh, methods. You can install as a client server type environment or as a standalone workstation. Uh, in the client server type environment, that's really intended for machines that have uh, you know dependable connectivity to the network. Um, it makes it really easy for the uh, CAD managers or whoever's uh, doing the maintenance on the software there to uh, basically update all the computers at once because uh, when we do the uh, updates to the FDOT software we really try to do everything server side so you don't have to run around to you know a hundred machines or whatever updating software so in that client server environment you can just uh, for example, with the maintenance releases, it's typically just a zip file you extract onto the server, and then uh, basically you've updated those hundred machines with uh, one zip file. Um, yeah, there's also very few files deployed to the client, and uh, that's why we can afford to uh, run so much from the server. Uh, really, the only thing that gets deployed to the client are things that the user will need to update for their preferences and uh, a couple of files to configure the workspace uh, basically to point everything back to the server. And of course in a client server environment uh, if you've been running FDOT software for very long at all you, you've uh, realized that the .NET configuration of the security is required. Um, basically what you have to do with .NET is tell the the uh, security to uh, trust applications within your intranet. Um, that way it can go ahead and run applications off the server and it won't restrict them to just the ones installed on the computer. And then if you do have a laptop or maybe a field office or something where uh, network connectivity is either not consistent or you know not very good, uh, then you can run like a standalone workstation and basically this will just com combine all of the uh, files that get installed with the server as well as the uh, files that, that get installed with the client into a single installation and it just copies them all to the uh, hard drive of the works workstation. In that case um, you know the .NET is not required but it, it still wouldn't necessarily hurt but it, it's not required to run the FDOT applications off the server anyway because they're all installed local um, and of course the size difference between those 
dozen files that the client copies in the standalone workstation. You see it copies nearly 10,000 files and it's you know just below 500 megabytes right now. So uh, it's a significant difference there as well. The uh, installation guide that gets posted with the installs is uh, it's, a, it's a good piece of information. We try to document things in there you'll need when planning to uh, deploy a new version of the FDFT software. It's going to list out the system requirements for the uh, version of software. Uh, it's going to list out also the version numbers of the platform. You know, for example, MicroStation version number, Geopack Suite version number, Power Geopack version number, all that type of stuff. Uh, which versions of uh, Office are supported by default? So details like that, uh, information that that can be useful when uh, planning a deployment is is listed in there. It also gives you those instructions to configure the .NET security, as well as some information on uh, how you can. Uh, what properties are required for silent installs and it goes through some screenshots uh, just showing some sample manual installations so there's just a variety of information about deploying the FDOT software available in the install guide Um, some details about the install, kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, when you run one of the FDOT client or workstation installs, basically it's going to scan the registry and try to locate the version of MicroStation or Power Geopack or Geopack Suite that you have installed. And uh, it's going to use that information in a couple of ways. So it's that's another reason why the install guide and having the right versions uh, is so important. Because when it finds those versions, that's going to determine uh, basically how the icons are created on the desktop and in the start menu. Um, it's really version dependent, especially back in... Uh, in FDOT 2010 when, when uh, Bentley changed the way that uh, Geopack was loading uh, it was really version specific uh, even between you know the SS2 releases um, because we've got to tag additional properties onto the icon in order to load Geopack after like version 494 or something like that back then uh, now that we've gone to FDOT SS2 and moving forward into FDOT SS3, uh, they're not as important, but the install is still going to look for that to know whether to even put a Power Geopack icon on there uh, or associate the FDOT icon with the uh, MicroStation and the Geopack suite. So uh, it's still very important to have the right versions. If you ever uh, do an install, and you don't get an FDOT SS2 icon on the desktop folder, basically that indicates that uh, an unexpected version of Geopack is installed. Um, also, it's going to take that information and it's going to store it in the registry along with the paths you define when prompted for your FDOT local directory, your FDOT server directory, and your projects directory. It's going to take that and the and the MicroStation Power Geopack data and populate all that information in the registry because it's used by uh, other applications um, in the FDOT software. Uh, so it's going to put it in a couple of places in the registry values. Uh, this and these are mainly used by applications that run, um, for example, in the past EDI would use the information in the registry values here under HKEY local machine software. Uh, in this case it's a 64-bit machine so it's a WOW 6432 node. Then you'll see an FDOT folder and in this case today we'll be looking at FDOT SS3 preparing for uh, uh, the upcoming release of that. So uh, you'd look in there and then you'll see a MicroStation and a Geopack uh, value and it would store the 
basically the path to those executables in there as well as uh, some uh, data information for uh, the create file application. And then it would store the locations for the FDOT uh, directories uh, right in the uh, FDOT SS3 directory. And this is what EDI and the applications running external to MicroStation would use. The applications running internal to MicroStation, uh, like off of the, uh, the FDOT menu, and all of the workspace information basically runs off of the Windows environment variables that get set. And uh, those are basically the same properties that get set in the registry here. Your FDOT SS3 local, FDOT SS3 projects, and FDOT SS3 server that, get, that you get prompted for during the installation. And all this information is also described in the README file. So you can go back and refer to it here or uh, you know, in the root of the FDOT directory on the server, there'll be a README file that's got you know, details about all of the uh, values that are being set. Okay, updating clients or renamed servers. Uh, this is a, a question I get a few times a year usually. Um, one of our offices or uh, a consultant's office will be getting a new server in and they'll be asking, uh, you know, what's the easiest way to to uh, deploy the new server and keep all of their clients and stuff working. Uh, basically, there's a couple of different ways you can handle that. You can, uh, if the server name changes, um, you can run around and reinstall all the clients. It's, you know, a real simple, quick install, and that way you know everything's getting uh, getting set properly. Or if you've got a way to deploy uh, updates to the registry and environment variables, then basically you can go in and update that uh, FDOT SS3 server environment variable and registry values. And one thing I, I note there is you want to be sure to include the trade uh, it says training backslash. It should be trailing backslash uh, because the the uh, rest of the variables in the FDOT workspace are going to be expecting that backslash to be there. Um, another thing to consider is that there are geopack properties that may need to be updated. Um, certain things get stored in user preferences or in project manager. Uh, even some of the dialogues, like the quarter modeler dialogue, you you can store a path to the uh, FDOT SS3 ITL file, for example. And if that path changes, basically it'll show up as an error uh, the next time the users go in there. So they'll just have to be aware that they'll have to go in and up, update some of those paths. Um, so, okay, so we got one question just came in before we move on while we're talking about paths. It says, what path does your example have for data path under the Power Geopack uh, registry? And uh, is this the path uh, to MicroStation or Power Geopack? So basically, uh, what you'll see in the registry Go ahead and run this. Um, let's just go to uh, H key local machine software. And then while wow, sixty four thirty two FDOT. Actually, I've got it messed up on this machine, so I'm not going to be able to show you. This is uh, information that the install just puts there. I took the screenshot off of my laptop. Um, and this one is just not set correctly. But basically the data path 
is just going to be the path to uh, whatever it finds in the registry. So what it searches for is uh, it searches for the Bentley values and it looks for um, like MicroStation 08, 11, 09 and it's going to copy the path name here and store that over in the FDOT directory as well and that's why the uh, like I said the versions of MicroStation that get installed or, or Geopack are important because uh, it's, it's going to search in a specific uh, registry location and if it doesn't find those it it has no way of uh, applying those properties to the icons and and setting those up so they don't get copied over but basically what it's going to do is it's going to copy this value over to the FDOT software so when our FDOT software runs it uh, can use that application associated with it by by default okay so moving on from the install into the configuration files um, basically this is the order that the configuration files get processed first of all the FDOT icon is I guess technically a configuration file um, so it's gonna run first of course when you double click on that it's gonna then call it the, the uh, UCF file from the uh, users machine this is the local FDOT uh, actually I should have said SS3 there just to be consistent but it's it's the same in FDOT 2008 2010 SS2 SS3 um, we've kinda adopted this this flow here um, so from the icon to the local UCF the local UCF will then call the site FDOT.txt the site FDOT.txt will uh, be processed throughout and then the U UCF will then call the discipline file associated so if you've got the uh, the standard menus applied the roadway.txt file will get called if you've got the right-of-way menu shown then the right-of-way menu will get called if you've got the uh, structures menu shown there then the structures will be called so whichever discipline uh, is is associated with uh, the the menu that gets applied that information gets updated in the UCF so it knows which discipline file to call and then it'll process all of the lines in the discipline files and then it'll go back to the UCF file and uh, the final section in there it's going to try to look for a file called customvars.txt and uh, then if it finds a custom vars.txt it will process all the lines in there and then basically microstation loads and all this is really loaded at the user level there's several different levels of course that uh, microstation will process things but we're doing everything through the UCF file so it's all technically as the user even though we've got it configured to where it's more of a, a client type server type uh, environment. So we'll go through each one of those and look at the uh, variables in a little more, more detail. The uh, FDOT SS3 icon, again SS2 2010, they're, they're the same. Um, those icons are really technically a configuration ver or file because uh, we're adding properties along besides just kicking off power geopack.exe the first thing we do with the icon is set a variable and that's what this minus ws does this is a switch that you can apply to a microstation or power geopack icon that will set a configuration variable anytime that icon is used so you could say ws and then any variable and its value and that'll get set so we set the WS uStation user. Basically, we're redirecting MicroStation from the default users directory defined in 
by Bentley to the FDOT SS3 workspace users directory locally. So that's where it'll look for the the uh, FDOT SS3 UCF file. Um, that file needs to be local because it gets updated as the user works and sets his menus it gets updated. Uh, if they do any uh, go to workspace configuration and set any variables it gets updated. So they need uh, write access to that file. Um, and that's just an example of how you can set that. Also uh, if you're uh, a project in a project wise environment and you don't use uh, project wise for your FDOT projects then you can tag this variable on there as well. This minus WS again sets the variable and this PW disable integration from desktop equals one. That way anytime you double click on the FDOT icon it won't you won't have to wait for the uh, project wise dialog to uh, to locate all its data sources before you close it down. So that's just a couple of examples of how you can set variables uh, through the icon. Um, so after it calls the UCF, again we're setting uh, other variables in here and the first thing or up near the top of the file what you'll see is we're setting uStation site equal to this FDOT SS3 server. And this is actually the Windows environment variable that gets set during the install that it's calling. We don't define that variable up higher in the file. It's just using the Windows environment variable as a microstation configuration variable. And then that way we'll populate everything based off of that variable and uh, that's why it's you know fairly easy to basically just change a few uh, registry settings on a machine and point it at a different server. Also um, the, the uh, you can see here where it's including the site fdot.txt after it's defining the base variables here for the user. Um, so as we've seen in this, the earlier slide it, it runs the UCF which calls the site fdot.txt it processes that entire file and then it comes down to this next line and starts reading on down. And this is some new information in FDOT SS3 when you, uh, when you choose your menu. We're setting variables as to which menu is set so it, you can again just check using a configuration files to know which menus the user is using and which files are being processed and so forth. Um, so in this example here I can tell that uh, only the roadway menu is being displayed. The construction's off, drainage is off, geotechnical is off, landscape is off. Um, I can kind of tell what's going on without even seeing microstation uh, interface. So basically it'll go in and set these variables and then it's going to include the roadway.txt because when it when you run this uh, menu configuration tool it's going to update basically which uh, dialogs are, or which uh, checkboxes are selected here and then it's also going to update the the line here where it calls the uh, discipline file based on whether it's standard menu which equals with the roadway.txt the uh, structures menu calls the structures text, right away text, and then photogrammetry text. So that's uh, kind of how those get included there. So at that point, it's going to read in that in entire discipline.txt file. And uh, then it's going to come back here to the UCF file and just continue reading down until it gets here. Basically, it's going to check to see if a custom VARs exist. If so, then it's going to include that, read it in from top to bottom, and then return you back to the UCF to finish out. So that's kind of how it is. It's just like a linear script that includes other scripts inserted in between. So 
So the site f dot text. Basically, what the site f dot text does is it sets common variables that are basically for all disciplines. So it'll set the base microstation variables, what color tables are used, uh, things like that. Um, you should never really go and update the site f dot text because every time we release an update. Um, it's going to probably be updated and it'll overwrite any changes you put in there. It, it becomes a maintenance problem at that point. Um, so you'll, I'll explain in here how you can uh, get around that. So after that site text file is read in, then it'll read the discipline.txt files. And basically in these files we're setting things that are more specific to the discipline like uh, uh, which DDB file is loaded in roadway versus right away, um, you know, which level libraries get loaded for the various disciplines, which cell libraries show up in the MS cell list, um, things like that. Just things that are more specific to a particular discipline. And again, you should, you should never really update uh, variables within the uh, text discipline text files because they too will be overwritten by the future maintenance releases. So that brings us to the custom vars.txt and this is where you should uh, make any of those modifications that you want to make to the workspace. So instead of putting them in the site f.txt or the discipline.txt files um, you would want to create a file called custom vars.txt in that directory, the FDFT SS3 workspace users directory on the server. And again, I want to point out that's on the server. Only the UCF file is the only uh, config file that gets copied down to the local machine. Um, so you would just create a basically a blank text file in there, and then you would define any variables that you want to then override. Uh, from the FDOT workspace or even maybe you want to include tag additional cell libraries on, include your own custom toolboxes or interface changes, uh, maybe you've got some text styles, dimension styles, print styles, that kind of stuff that you want to incorporate uh, with the FDOT workspace that you've just kind of customized for your own office. Um, project, discipline, subdirectories, um, for example, I, I just used that in there. You could add a, uh, a geopack or a cross sections or uh, whatever directories you want to under the discipline directories. Of course, the root of the project and the main discipline directories are defined in the CPCH and they have to be there. You can't add or remove those necessarily, but you can add or remove any directories you want below say the roadway directory. So you could just have that set up to where they were just automatically created when a project was created using MicroStation um, by adding those to your uh, custom vars.txt file. Some of the commonly updated variables, um, MSDGN lib list of course is is uh, one you'd want to add for things like your styles, your print styles, text styles, dimension styles. Uh, all that kind of stuff is stored in a DGN lib. So you would want to uh, add those to a DGN lib list here. Um, text favorite symbols you might have. Uh, we provide a favorite symbols.xml file with the workspace. That way in the microstation text window you get uh, things like your baseline, centerline symbols, things like that are easy to access. But if there are a few others that, that uh, you prefer to have then you can expand on the one we give you and uh, just point your workspace to use your own so it'll have a larger list of your favorite symbols. Uh, MS cells, this, this basically is the search path for any cell libraries so if you were to type in the command RC equals in the cell library name uh, it's going to search in 
the path defined in this variable. So if you want to add uh, basically a path to your server location to where you can keep all your customized cells in a, a single location, uh, you can include that there. If you want to include it, include it in the uh, microstation cell list variable, basically that defines uh, which cell libraries get listed in, uh, let's see, do I have microstation open? Not yet. So we'll go ahead and open that up. Uh, this defines which cell libraries get listed from the microstation uh, cell dialog. When you click file, uh, and it's got a list of cells that's defined by that that MS cell list. That's also what gets read in is all the cell libraries in that cell list get read in when you say AC equals and say give a a name of a cell. Uh, it's going to search every cell library in that list for that name. If it doesn't find it, then it'll tell you cell not found. If it does find one, it's going to find the first one and quit looking. So you want to be sure to have uh, unique cell names if you do create your own cell library. Um, you don't want to use the same like SH plan for a plan sheet cell name because it's going to find the first one and then just stop looking. Uh, so in that example, if we go to element cells, and we look at this drop down here. Say I wanted to add a cell library to this list. Uh, that would that's what gets defined with that MS cell list. Uh, MS idle timeout. Basically, this is used to close microstation if it's not active within in this example here by default 90 minutes. Um, function key menus, you can use this to define a custom function key menu for uh, your environment. I will say that uh, in the past we we haven't deployed a function key menu with the FDOT workspace. Uh, we've just used whatever uh, microstation gets deployed with or you know let users define it however they want. However, in FDOT SS3, we will be deploying a function key menu, so uh, you'll want to review that. We'll have uh, descriptions and information on that when we get closer to the release. But it'll be providing a lot of, a lot of new functionality to the SS3 workspace. Um, also, pen tables, plot paths, all your plotting variables, things like that you would set in here as well. Uh, just different ways you can use to uh, customize your your workspace for your environment there. Um, I also included a link down here at the bottom of the page. This is just a Bentley Communities page that has a long list of different microstation configuration variables that that you can use to define locations and paths and files for the uh, for the workspace. So when you're working on that custom vars.txt, there's a certain syntax that's required. Um, not knowing exactly how familiar the audience would be today uh, with with uh, writing configuration files, I, I just want to take a uh, minute to talk a little bit about syntax. Basically, in the configuration files, it's going to require that uh, certain things be be defined. Um, basically define a variable, you want to define the variable name and then use an operator, an equal sign, a greater than sign, less than sign, uh, and then a value to assign to that variable name. Um, you can also include comments even in line or before the line. Basically if you use a pound sign anything after that pound sign for the rest of that line is a comment. So basically in this example here you see it'll define a variable and then it'll have a comment describing that variable after that. Oops. Variable names uh, are alphanumeric. 
you got to have at least two characters in there to define a variable name. Um, other than the uh, alphanumeric characters, you can use an underscore. Uh, also, anything that starts with an underscore is defined as a hidden variable, and you have to. It wouldn't show up by default in MicroStation. It would be set, but it wouldn't be easily accessible unless you set a variable saying to show your hidden variables, uh, which we do with the FDOT workspace. Because when you're troubleshooting problems, that's just the kind of information you're going to need is all that uh, good stuff that's hidden, right? Um, like I said, anything after a pound sign is going to be treated as a comment and the rest of that line is ignored. File paths should be used using a uh, forward slash. So if you're going to define a path to a server like M, FDOT, MyCell library or whatever, you should separate all the directories with a forward slash when you're defining them in a variable. Um, it's going to automatically convert those over. It, MicroStation is getting better about accepting backslashes uh, for paths and stuff than forward slashes, but you know, it, I'm still still tend to try to use the the forward slashes with paths uh, just to avoid any possible uh, errors. Um, when you're editing a configuration file, you want to be sure there's an empty line. Basically, you want to hit enter after the last line and create an empty line at the end of the file. Uh, and this is required to make sure that that last line gets processed because it needs to go all the way through that line and then come to the next one to, uh, to process that. Uh, and if you don't have uh, an enter at the end of a line, most likely you're going to be getting a, an error message when you click on the icon to start MicroStation. It's just going to not know how to process that and, and throw it up as an invalid variable definition. So I mentioned earlier in operators, like I said, you, you define a variable, an operator, and then the value. The operators, this is how they're used. An equal sign basically overwrites, it assigns a new value to a variable name, and it would overwrite any existing values. So you want to be very careful when using a, an equal sign because uh, you can quickly uh, mess things up. But sometimes you want to override things, so use it as needed. Um, the uh, colon there basically will let you assign a new variable name only if it doesn't already exist, so that's kind of a, a, a tentative definition there. Uh, a plus allows you to append a new value to a current variable name. Uh, the most common ones used, though, are going to be the equal sign, the greater than, the less than, and so forth. Basically, what this will allow you to do here is append a variable to the end of a current list, like the MSL list. If you wanted your cell library to show up at the bottom of the list in the cell dialog, you would use this character. If you wanted to show up, wanted it to show up at the beginning of the cell list then you would prepend it using this character and it would show up at, as the first cell, cell library in that list. There's also, also some preprocessor directives. You noticed uh, when we was looking at the files earlier that there was an if statement in there saying if that custom vars.txt is found then go ahead and process it. Uh, and those were used, basically that was used defining these uh, preprocessor directives. And basically these are conditions that you can apply uh, to a statement to conditionally set things uh, or to include things. Like you see percent include, that's how we include the, the uh, site.txt, the discipline.txt, the custom bars.txt. It was used with the percent include and then the uh, file to include. Uh, percent if 
and then an expression percent if defined and then the variable name so if that variable is defined then you know that value is true go ahead and process the statement in the in the if statement uh, so like earlier when we was looking at uh, the roadway menu being turned on I could say if defined or uh, actually that would be an e equality statement um, maybe if we want to see if, if roadway menu is uh, roadway.txt file is defined uh, there's also a variable in there that does that then you could see if the roadway.txt file was processed and if so then you could tag on additional information for your roadway users and then that way it would process those even if the roadway menu wasn't on but say a traffic plans menu was on it would still process those because the roadway.txt file is used and uh, then you would end that with an end if statement so basically if you have an if statement you've got to close it with close it with a percent percent end if you can also have else's um, you can also define errors so if it didn't find that variable you could uh, then say percent error and pop a, a message up on the screen saying uh, you know roadway menu not set or something like that uh, so there's just these are just different conditional things that you can use to uh, when uh, creating your config files and here's some examples of those this will explain it a little bit better um, here's one that's conditional on the value of a variable so if you wanted to see if that traffic plans menu I was talking about was open and not just uh, the roadway text file was being used then you could do percent end if that va variable is equal to one then go ahead and load the special sign cells that you've had created um, another example it's uh, this is conditional on a files existence so you can check to see if that custom bars exists and if so then go ahead and include that or you can even go down and make it conditional on a particular user you can say uh, you want to include say a custom function key thing per user so if the person currently logged in their username is this then go ahead and include this function key menu and this button menu so you can do it you can see how you can use it at these statements at various levels to uh, to customize an environment as needed um, directives these are just some additional uh, uh, ways of processing variables for example if I if I had uh, my workspace files set at a at a uh, location relative to the FDOT directory um, then I could actually find out where the FDOT directory is grab its parent directory so and then include my path to uh, where my files are below that so I could do all, all of that based on the Windows environment variable to locate my own location on the server relative to something that's already set um, I've included these in here we don't have time to get into all of them but there's a description from uh, the text files and the, that will describe each one of these and how they can be used to basically build variables off of other variables there's also a good article out on Ask Inga about this um, I went ahead and posted a link to that there you can go in and get a little bit more information about those there from there as well uh, here's just another little quick tip from Ask Inga it's just a way that you can quickly restore the defaults you know if MicroStation is acting kind of weird you don't know what's going on um, it stores a lot of temporary files in various locations on the machine you could go to all these different directories and manually delete the stuff or you could just add this switch to the icon run the icon once and it's going to go ahead and clean everything up for you and you just remove the uh, switch and uh, start MicroStation as normal. 
That's also a tip from asking asking. That's a good place to go out and research stuff. Some of the stuff is dated, but uh, MicroStation has been working the same way for a long time. So other than getting the very latest configuration variables, uh, it's a good place to do research. Um, you can also get variables while you're in MicroStation. If you want to know what a variable is set to, uh, you can just type in exp or you say you want to set a variable in MicroStation without closing and going back in. You can just go to the key in window, say expand set, define the configuration variable, use the operator, and then set the configuration value. And then it would set that without closing MicroStation and go back in. Of course, that's going to be dependent on certain things. You couldn't like include a new DGN live during a session. You could go ahead and set it, but you'd have to close it and then reopen MicroStation to get it there to reread, but you can set values using a key in. You can also, uh, if you want to set it and save it, then you're going to have to use this and then it would write it to the uh, UCF file as well. You can also use the expand echo command uh, and basically what this will do if you do expand echo and then just type in a configuration variable name it will return the value of that configuration variable in the status bar. That way you can you can uh, see what values are set to, to a particular variable. Okay, so let's just go in before we move on and look at some of that stuff real quick. Basically, um, what you're seeing here is we've got, uh, I showed you this. Um, Typically, the things you would want to go in and customize, like I said, you might have some custom cell libraries, uh, print styles, maybe you create some custom toolboxes. So you want to uh, have a, a custom toolbox that you could, you know, click and load and have your own tools set up there. Um, that's the kind of stuff you could you could build to uh, help. I guess make your users in your office more productive or even to uh, standardize things for your office or or so forth. So how would you do that? Again, you would go out to the FDOT SS3 directory, SS2 directory, 2010 directory on the server and in this case I'm set up Everything's on my local machine, but I'm treating it like my D drive is the server and my C drive is the local workstation. So if I look here at FDOT SS3, I've only got two directories. I got a workspace directory where my users and my UCF file is defined. This is where all my different preferences get set. Um, basically default interface stuff, buttons, function key assignments, that type of stuff. Uh, and temporary files like your GeoPack resources. So this is really all that gets installed local. But you can see all that stuff is dynamic and that's why the user has to have read only or I'm sorry, read write access to this directory. Um, if we look at the D drive, FDOT SS3, uh, this is going to have all of the workspace files. These can this directory can be read only um, to where you can control the environment a little bit, uh, manage the stuff. Uh, it's not stuff doesn't get deleted or overwritten, that type of thing. Um, if I go to the workspace users directory here, this is where all of the configuration files except the UCF file are read from. So the site f.txt and so forth, there is a UCF file here, but it doesn't get read from here. This is the one that gets copied to the local machine. So we've got uh, the site f.txt. <laughs> Again, you wouldn't want to modify these, but what you could do is you come in here and find values that you would want to copy in. So a lot of times I'll open this up when I'm creating a custom vars.file. And I would basically just come in here and say new, text document, say custom 
darstxt and as long as it's created in this directory oops and it's got to be spelled right of course now anytime any value that I set in here uh, Let's say that equals. So I'm just going to set this as an example. So I, I just set a value underscore AA equals one, two, three, just to make sure it's reading. And I'll just save this, close MicroStation, go back in. And when we go to workspace configuration, you should see that value sh showed, shown up in there. So even though this file didn't get delivered with the workspace, this is the file I would use to define any values for my uh, local environment. Take just a minute to open up here. And then we'll just go to uh, workspace configuration. And you see I, I used that underscore AA just as a test because I know it would come up right at the top and you can see that it's reading that file in. So that's just a, a simple way you can test to make sure that everything is spelled right, it's being read into the workspace well enough. So now I could come in here and say this is, uh, maybe put a comment in the top, this is my variables. Uh, And uh, then you would just basically start defining variables. So again, if you wanted to add a, uh, a cell library or you had your own directory up on the server somewhere, you might go ahead and define that. So uh, say your company name. Uh, the example I was using in here was uh, ENG Corp. So it's just an engineering corporation. Uh, equals and then define the path so whatever it might be z colon again forward slash and uh, so this will be a basically the root of my environment and then under there I might have a cell library directory I might have a DGN library so I might just put them all in there and I just point to that by defining this variable, anytime I want to refer to this path, I can uh, then just say my next variable is say cell libraries. So I'll say ms underscore cells. Um, and I don't want to say equals because if I do an equals, it's going to wipe out. Oops. If I use an equals, it's going to wipe out all of the cell lists or all of the other directories that get searched for. So that would overwrite any that MicroStation sets, any that FDOT sets. I will, if I want it to show up at the end of the list or search my directories last, I would do it at the end. If I wanted to search my directories first, I would prepend it and do it at the first. And then I could say dollar sign ng corp and then close the parentheses and uh, basically now with this variable it's going to search in this directory for all of my cell libraries um, and if I did an MS cell list to list out the specific cell libraries basically I could do the same thing um, maybe I have three cell libraries in there but I only want to show up one or two on the list then I could do this slash and give it the cell name like sign cells and then it would look in this directory and it would include that MS cell list I'm sorry then it would include that cell library with my uh, in my cell library dialog 
I've set up some other examples here just to sh show you kind of how it works. So I've got this example config vars here where I did something similar. I've got an ENG corp root basically that defines the root of my directory. I've included a DGN live that's got some custom interface stuff in it. I've included a cell library and some cell lists. Again, this could keep going. It could be user based, it could be site based, it could be menu based. Um, so I'm just going to copy this data into my custom vars file and save that just for time's sake. And uh, we'll close MicroStation and restart it and kind of look at the differences. So if we open MicroStation back up, I should have a new DGN Live defined that's going to have a couple of custom tools I built in there as an example. It's going to have uh, the cell show up in the cell list. So let's go ahead and open up a file that's got, oh, what do we have here? Let's open up, our, I wanted to find a file that's got a sheet in it here. Because one of the tools I built uh, is looking for a sheet border. So we've got this file, it's got a sheet border, actually it's got a couple of sheet borders. So um, if we look at element and cells, uh, we've got, you notice this is ENG Corp and then ENG Corp cell library. It's at the beginning of the list because I used a prepend and if I was to look in that path, it's gonna that's where it's pulling that directory from is this ENG Corp Z, ENG Corp cells, and then the cell library name. So that's how it did this. Since I prepended it, if I had a cell in there named SH plan that was customized and I went to here to place a new plan sheet it's just going to call SH plan so this would call the SH plan to find an ENG Corp instead of the FDOT SH plan so that's what I'm saying you got to be careful about just consider things like cell names and things like that in the uh, order that you are applying cell libraries um, also, I should have a custom toolbox in here. So if I go to uh, Control T, and uh, I think I named it ENG Corp as well. So yeah, ENG Corp custom tools. So I could go in and build a custom toolbox, and just say OK, and have that loaded and available in the workspace. So I could go up there and dock it or whatever. Um, and it could call up my, my signal cells and place the signal cells from a web page or however I might want to do it. Uh, maybe it just calls up a particular signal cell. Uh, or maybe I've got a custom tool I wrote there like this one just goes in and fences, applies a print style and creates a PDF for me. So just with a couple of clicks there I just created a PDF file from the uh, first sheet in this list. Um, but you can see how you can go and build tools to, to, I guess, enhance the productivity and just include those two, just common tools that you would use in your environment and uh, include those in the workspace as well. <coughs> uh, I do want to get to the last couple slides here and explain um, get to the right one and explain a couple of the custom applications we've got going on. Um, FDOT config is an application that runs anytime uh, the FDOT workspace is loaded. Basically, this is how we define this MS ref dir value on the fly, and this is the value used to locate reference files. And uh, 
basically what the reference files do is it allows us to not set a full path that way it's it, it searches in a particular project so when when a microstation starts up it tries to locate the root of the project and it does that by looking for the meta info directory and so it'll if you're in the roadway directory it'll look in the roadway directory for a meta info directory if it finds it it defines that as the root of the project if it doesn't find it it's going to back up one directory and search there for a meta info directory if it finds it it's going to define that as the root and and all the subdirectories so basically it's just going to keep backing up until it finds a meta info directory and it's going to say okay this is the root of my project i want to add all the subdirectories to my reference the ms refter value and then that way that's how you can move a topo file from roadway or from say uh, uh, structures to roadway and it's not going to break the the reference um, but it's also why you might get broken references if the topo is in the road or survey directory and you've got a meta info directory in your roadway directory um, that's why it's so important to have one meta info directory and it's in the root of your project um, Another thing that you can do with uh, FDOT config, and this is probably only known by just a few people, is you can have it include or or uh, ignore other directories as well on a project by project basis. So if I had a project that had a, an alternate A and an alternate B under Redway, and I had a DSGNRDR01 in alternate A and alternate B. Well, by default, it's going to find the first one it, it comes to. So it would always use alternate A. Um, so I can add a FDOT config.xml file in the root of the project and tell it to ignore alternate A so it can get down to that one in alternate B. And basically, that's like I say, it's useful in working with alternates. Uh, if you've got applications that create a lot of subdirectories, uh, I had a support call once where somebody was using a drainage application, and it created like 180 directories under their drainage folder. And basically, that ate up all of the space of the MS Refter before it ever got past drainage so all of their references were broken um, so in that case you would have wanted to ignore a lot of those subdirectories under drainage that didn't include uh, DGN files or reference files so that's just a couple examples of how you would want to use that basically how it works you can copy the FDOT config uh, XML file from the MDL apps directory on the root of your project so if we look or from the MDL apps directory on the server. So if you look in your server directory under MDL apps, there's going to be an FDOT config. Uh, that's the application that runs. And then there's going to be an FDOT config.xml. And, and uh, this is basically what gets ignored by default in the workspace. Is It's not really opening up, is it? Let's open it up with Notepad++. This is basically what gets ignored by default uh, in the FDOT workspace. We're ignoring the ENG data folders because you really shouldn't have the uh, DGN files in there. And we're, we're ignoring the meta info folder because there shouldn't really be DGNs in there. That's uh, for the electronic delivery stuff. So if I wanted to also ignore my admin directory, my my uh, data directory, my cell directory, you know, whatever else you want to ignore, um, you can do that as well. And all I would have to do is do a file, save as, save this down to my project directory. Um, so I have to save it to like CE projects and then whatever my project directory is and just save it right in the root of the project. 
and then I could just add another directory to it by going here and saying uh, say I want to ignore my admin directory and then it wouldn't find any DGNs as references in the admin directory. You also have a couple of properties that you can set. You can ignore the folder which is set to true um, and you can ignore subfolders. So if I wanted to ignore the admin directory but I wanted to read in a subdirectory under admin then I could set that to false and it would ignore only the admin directory but still read in all the subdirectories. So that's just a couple of properties that can be applied to that. And uh, so that just shows some examples here on the slide. Um, also Sheet Navigator. You can customize Sheet Navigator uh, for your like engineer record cells. Uh, you can also define ignored files and directories in there as well. Um, and that can really speed up the processing of Sheet Navigator in some cases. Um, first of all, we'll talk about the EOR cells. So, for example, when you click on in Sheet Navigator on Add Engineer Record Cell, there's uh, a list that it pops up by default. You can override that list or add to that list uh, your own cells. So you can have uh, cell libraries out on your server with a cell, an engineer record cell for each of the engineers in your office and just have them pop up on the list. Um, basically to do that you would want to create a site level settings.xml file. So basically, basically you'd open up Sheet Navigator, go to settings, create site level settings xml file. That's going to create a sheet info underscore settings.xml file in the FDOT SS3 MDL apps directory on the server. Um, and then that's where you would do your customizations for your office. If you wanted it on a project level, you would just cr choose the one right below that and it's going to create it in the root of the project instead of on the site. So there's a couple of different levels you can set that. Um, editing the site level settings, basically there are a couple of key areas. There's a merge settings tag that allows you to anything you include in there, it merges in with current FDOT settings. And there's an override settings area, which basically will replace the data. That's why back here on this, you've seen just this and not all the FDOTs. I put that variable in the override settings, so I'm seeing only the FDOT or my company. Uh, engineer record cells and not the default FDOT engineer record cells. Um, and uh, let's see. And then and this just shows some examples of it. Um, like here you've got in this case it's doing it in the merge setting. So if I wanted to have, you know, I've got five engineers in the office, I could go out, create a cell library. Uh, put their their information in each one of those and then just add a data line in here for each one of those and it would in this case it would merge that in with all of the currently available FDOT engineer record cells and uh, basically you can see the line here and it would then include that basically it defines the name that shows up in the list the cell library to pull the cell from and uh, the cell name and you can get that information by just going into the sheet info XML and copying an example line from that into yours so if I go back to uh, and I think that's really the end of it so if we just look at that real quick um, if we go to here and go to our MDL apps directory and look at sheet info.xml and I'll just open this with notepad plus plus and basically you'll have you'll see all these different values in here and if we look at the sheet info settings xml 
this is like the local one that gets created when you choose that option it'll be a little bit different you see you got override settings you've got sales you got engineer record sales um, the one on the server is going to be a lot more detail that's going to have a lot more information in it uh, but basically you would just look for the same area that you're wanting to update that's available in the settings XML and you could just copy a piece of data from that so you'd come down here and find out where uh, say an engineer record cell is at and did I already pass them fields oh yeah they were up at the top I started below them so you could just use one of these as an example copy it over to yours um, and then update the information and in this case I've got it in the override settings field so it would override any of the FDOT if I wanted to include them I would just uh, collapse this section to get it out of the way for example here and I would go down to the merge settings and add it here uh, yeah add it there and then I could update the name that gets listed in the dialog the cell library name and the uh, cell name so that's just a couple of uh, ways you can do that um, you could also like I said there you can ignore files and folders so I could add uh, information in here to ignore any files that have the word junk in them if I got a bunch of uh, junk.dgns in there or whatever I can ignore all of those and they won't get processed they won't look for sheets it won't do updates um, those alternate folders if I don't want those scanned for sheets I can add those in as, as uh, ignored folders um, just other examples of how you can do that basically the the tighter you make that list the faster sheet navigator is going to mine uh, it's going to be a balancing act though because the tighter you make that list the uh, less data that's going to be automated for example if you have say a C sheet note in your text file or a different file and you ignore that file then that note's not going to get updated when you renumber so it's like I say it's just a balancing act kind of think ahead uh, before you add the ignore things and um, uh, plan appropriately so that's really it for sheet navigator I'm just going to close this down and try to hit a couple questions real quick uh, one I'd like to read over your print to PDF source code as I wrote uh, one very similar uh, sure just give me a uh, just wondering how I define the fence basically I just apply a print style uh, and the print style applies the fence for me and I can even I didn't even have to click that if I also included a plot driver that had auto overwrite defined it would just basically I'd create the button and a PDF would show up in my directory I'd never have to really do anything um, is there a way to create a new menu in the taskbar on the left of the screen yes and that's kind of what we'll be looking at in next week's webinar customizing the interface um, also that's part similar to the one of creating the toolbars in the previous question um, Jimmy once you're done you send the presentation okay uh, so that's it I'm surprised there weren't more questions uh, thanks everybody for attending we're running a few minutes late uh, I hope to see you again next week when we look into customizing the interface uh, creating custom toolbars updating the task menu right-click menus all that kind of stuff have a good week.